Good morning on this Easter Sunday morning, the day we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. What a special day. And uh, Christians all over the world today are, are greeting one another with these words. And please, you know them, respond as uh, I say to you, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And uh, many of the children would have received possibly a surprise this morning, and, and we did uh, the other day at our front door. That was a lovely thing. Thank you. And we're going to now um, meet Jess again, who's going to introduce another special uh, song. It was lovely, Jess, the other day on Good Friday to have uh, Chelsea and David. And uh, they're going to play for us again today. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yes, so um, we have another song today that we recorded in the little church and uh, David and Chelsea have been rehearsing again and getting it all ready for you. And the song today is called Jesus is Alive. Hope you enjoy.
The reading for today is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, beginning at verse 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now, I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, there they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went to the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money. They told them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, though some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. For the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Happy Easter. It is great to be with you for church at home today. A friend of mine was in the Holy Land for Easter a few years ago with his wife and his mother-in-law. He wasn't really happy the mother-in-law was going with them uh, because she was uh, a bit ill ill in health and uh, quite frankly, she was a bit horrible and nasty. And uh, so he didn't really want her there, but there they were. Now, really sadly, and it's unfortunate, she did pass away while they were there in the Holy Land and they were given the opportunity to bury her there uh, for the cost of around $500 or ship her body home to Australia for the cost of $8,000. Now they weighed this up and made the decision to bring the mother-in-law's body back to Australia. And when asked why they chose that option and that high expense, he said that he'd heard about a man being uh, died and buried about 2,000 years ago in the Holy Land and he came back to life again and he didn't want to risk that with his mother-in-law. <laughs> you know, the fact we're still talking about the resurrection 2,000 years after it happened really, uh, really helps us to understand that it really did happen. You know, many people struggle with the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, along with the virgin birth and the imminent return. He will come back one day. 
Now, I'm not going to touch at all on the virgin birth today or the return of Jesus, apart from to say uh, the scriptures say that one day he will return and every eye will see him. And I used to wonder how that could possibly happen. Uh, but the way we're doing live streaming and using the internet now, I believe when he comes back, every eye will see him, even if it's just on a screen. That's all I'm going to say about that today, because I want us to really focus on the resurrection if you're one of those who doubt the resurrection, that's okay. You're in good company. Even the first disciples doubted. It says so in the scripture that Wayne just read to us. And other scriptures too, you've probably heard of doubting Thomas. He said, I won't believe that Jesus is risen from the dead until I can put my finger in the hole in his hands. And when Jesus fronted up to Thomas and said, hey, Thomas, put your finger in the holes in my hands and in my side too. It is me, I'm risen. Thomas believed. So doubting is okay if it leans you into seeking the truth and coming to a greater faith. Now, when I was going through my divorce about 14 years ago, that was a real crisis of faith for me. See, God hates divorce. I hate divorce. I never wanted to get divorced and do that to my children. I myself came from a broken home and I know how devastating that is. And so I really struggled with understanding why a good God would lead me to that point when I was in such an abusive marriage that the only option I had was to leave. And so this crisis of faith really led me to question, am I making up God into the God I want him to be? Or is what I believe about God really true? So I decided to enrol in Bible College, Bible College of Victoria, to see if what I believed about God is true or not. I remember my first subject there that ripped my faith to shreds. Everything I believed about the Bible was not true. And so uh, just rebuilding my faith back on the truth has become so much stronger than it ever was before. And here I am before you, a full-time minister today. Doubts are okay if they lead you to seeking the truth. That happened for another guy called Lee Strobel. He was a reporter and an atheist. And when his wife became a Christian, he decided that he would go about trying to research and refute all the Christian claims, including the resurrection. All the discoveries he made, though, he could not refute these claims and he himself became a Christian as well. Again, I'll say doubts are okay if they cause you to seek the truth. Now, if you are doubting uh, today about the resurrection, I hope that you'll seek after the truth about that and come to realise that Jesus is, in fact, the risen King, worthy of our worship. Last week, I started a sermon a series, a two-part series on worship the King and spread the good news of his kingdom in word and deeds. On Palm Sunday, we looked that Jesus was indeed the King that God promised to send, not just to Israel for the people of his day to save them, but to save all the people from all nations of all time. Jesus is the risen King, and he wants us to spread the good news of his kingdom in word and deed. Now, both of those aspects of this saying are evident in the reading that we heard today. So if you open up your Bibles at Matthew 28, we pick up the story that Jesus uh, had been buried in a tomb. He was killed on the Friday, crucified, buried in a tomb. A big stone was put in front of the tomb so that uh, no one could go in and no one could go out. And then in the Jewish uh, um, way of life, they had the Sabbath and no one could go about doing any work. And so here, the day after the Sabbath, on the third day, two women, Mary and Mary, are going to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body uh, his dead body with some herbs and spices. I'm sure it wasn't herbs and spices, but spices at least. And so they're going to the tomb and they're wondering who is going to roll the stone away for them. And on the way, you know, they never thought that Jesus would be resurrected, even though he had told these women and the disciples that this would happen. And so wondering who will open the tomb, you can imagine their surprise when an angel appears and the earth quakes and the angel rolls the stone away and says, come, see, he is risen, the tomb is empty. They were amazed, they weren't expecting that. No one had seen the resurrection itself, there are no eyewitnesses, but there is enough proof afterwards to show that he indeed is risen. 
Now, a lot of people like to speculate that he perhaps uh, was stolen by the disciples or by their enemies, but neither of these claims hold up. For example, if the disciples had stolen the body, they would not have had women be the first witnesses to his resurrection. See, in those days and surrounding cultures, women's testimonies were not valid. They were not believed. They were unreliable, so to say. And so if the disciples had taken Jesus' body, they would have had men there with concrete testimonies as evidence to say, uh, you know, to cover up their claims. But there was no cover up. And indeed, Jesus uh, validated women, having women be the first to see him after his resurrection. He really fought for equality and, uh, and believed in the testimony of women, treating women and men as equals. In fact, all people as equals. So it's unlikely that Jesus was stolen by the disciples and even more unlikely that he was stolen by their enemies. If the enemy stole his body, then they were just working against the very thing they were trying to do. They defeated their own purpose. They were the ones, in fact, to put guards at the tomb to make sure that his body was not stolen. They didn't want anyone thinking that he'd been raised to the dead. They wanted him dead in that tomb. Unfortunately, the guards had uh, failed to guard that tomb from Jesus rising and disappearing. And so they actually, in failing their duty, could have been killed. They deserved execution. So they did not actually go to their superior officers. They did not go to Pilate. They went to the chief priests who wanted to cover up this miracle as much as they did. And the chief priests and the elders planned a, a cover-up story. Let's say his body was stolen. And they paid those soldiers a lot of money to keep up that story. It's a pretty good incentive to start a lie, being paid a lot of money, a bribe, and also being saved from being executed, what they really deserved. A lot of people will lie to get themselves out of trouble. And many people find it easier to believe lies than the truth. But the fact that we are still celebrating Jesus' resurrection more than 2,000 years later goes to show that it really did happen. If it didn't happen, our Christian faith is worthless and useless. And none of us have any hope. But it, if it did happen, then Jesus is king he reigns over life and death and he's worthy to be praised. All authority is his and he wants us to share the good news of his kingdom with everyone. We see that in this scripture as well. We see the women being called, you know, to come in by the angel. Come in and see the tomb is empty. He's risen. Now go tell the disciples to go to Galilee where Jesus will meet them. And then... The going away to see the disciples, the women are running away frightened and full of joy and they see Jesus and they worship him and then Jesus himself tells them, go, tell the disciples to meet me in Galilee. And so they go and they tell the 11 disciples, you know, Jesus is going to meet you in Galilee, go there and see for yourselves and they do. They go, they see Jesus, they worship him though some of them doubted. That's what it says here in verse 17. Doubting is okay if it leads you further into truth and understanding of the risen king. And despite their doubts, Jesus says to them, go spread the good news. He says, all authority on heaven and earth is given to me. Therefore, go make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them everything I have taught you. And I am with you till the end of the age. They're told to share the truth about Jesus with everyone. And we know they did because this story, all the stories of Jesus have been told from generation to generation to generation, being passed on and written in the scriptures to be passed on as well. So we know that they kept telling the story to others. And today, friends, it's our turn. It's our turn now to keep telling the story and making more disciples of Jesus Christ. 
That's what we are called to do. It's not just a job for the clergy or for those with missionary hearts. It's for every believer. We are all called to share the good news of Jesus. Now, the church has not been good at making disciples uh, for so many years. It's the default of the church just to make Christians and encourage them to sit in a pew as a spectator. But that's not discipleship, and I'm sorry that we have failed you in that way. And that's why I don't mind that the coronavirus pandemic has caused us to have to do church a little bit differently. Now, I do miss church. I miss gathering with God's people, and I miss you, and I love you so much, and I look forward to the day we can meet again. But for this time, it gives us a chance to think about what does it really mean to be a follower of Jesus? How do we live as disciples today? And how do we disciple others? How can we do it better? And we can look at all the stories in the scriptures, in the book of Acts and the way the early church did it. You know, they just, wherever they were, they went about making disciples, sharing the good news and sharing what they have, which in fact, many of us from Christ Church Stingley are already doing. We're, we're having conversations at a deeper level than we ever would have at church over a cup of tea. We're really sharing how we're going and what we need and how we are traveling with Jesus and how our faith is going. And that is what discipleship is. It's journeying with people and helping them wrestle with their doubts and their fears and come to a greater understanding of the Lord. It's, you know, teaching others to learn from Jesus like we have. That's what discipleship is. And can you imagine how strong in our faith and how encouraged and joy filled, filled we would all be if we were all discipling at least one other person? I'd love to see that. That'd be awesome. It'd be like we all have apprentices, which is how Jesus taught his first disciples. He called them, he called his inner 12, and he said, okay, this is what I want you to do. And he showed them and then he sent them out and he said, go teach everyone about what I've taught you and heal the sick and care about people and share the good news of the kingdom. And they did not feel qualified at first. And to be honest, they weren't really good at it at the start, but they were faithful. And they did what Jesus asked them to do. And they kept doing that. They kept learning from Jesus and teaching others to do the same and getting them to learn from Jesus and they taught others and they learned from Jesus and taught others. And that's how discipleship works. It's a beautiful thing. We are all commissioned to do that. So wherever you go and wherever you are, if you're staying home, which we all should be at the moment, witness to Christ make disciples. Every phone call you make, every message you send, influence others for Christ. His kingdom is good news, even when we're at home. So know this, that he is with you. He's promised to be with you even till the end of the age. He's promised to be with you as we gather together. He's promised to be with us as we go out into the world. He's promised to be with us as we stay home. He's promised to be with us as we make disciples. So wherever you are, make disciples. Keep worshipping the King. Keep spreading the good news of his kingdom in word and deed. And know God is with you always, even till the end of the age. I'm not going to finish with a prayer today. I'm going to leave you with some questions to ponder at home. You might like to discuss them with your family if you've got your family around you or comment in the comment section if you'd like to discuss them uh, with others who are online at the moment. Uh, just ponder them yourself for personal reflection. So we'll put those questions up now and I encourage you just to, just to think on them and respond. We're going to give you five minutes and then Wayne will come in and uh, finish our time together with a prayer. God be with you.
Well, thank you, Tanya. That was a terrific uh, reminder and, and uh, encouragement and challenge as to what we're meant to be about, isn't it, folks? So um, how did you go with the questions? How did you go with your discussion and thinking? And uh, that doesn't stop now, of course. We can keep on uh, with those questions as we uh, contact each other during the week and as in our prayers. Who are you discipling? Who am I discipling? Who's discipling us? So let's uh, come in prayer, shall we? Um, Father, thank you for the privilege uh, that we have to live in these days following Jesus' resurrection and to be entrusted with this task of sharing this good news and leading others to become followers of Jesus. Lord, we need your help. We can't do this on our own. We need the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, that you provide the Holy Spirit to all who ask you freely. So, Father, fill us with the Holy Spirit, with boldness, with love and compassion, and a, a, a zeal, a fire within our bellies to share Jesus at every opportunity, in word and in deeds of kindness. Help us to so seek first the kingdom of God and your ways that others will see Jesus living in us transparently, both in our own lives and in the lives that we share as a community together. Please, Lord, move on the hearts of the people of Dingley and Cheltenham and Mentone and Keysborough and Noble Park and Bond Beach and all around us, over this nation and indeed over the world. Lord, increase the hunger and thirst for things of God as many other things are stripped away that people might seek you as never before. Father, we pray also for our brothers and sisters in other lands who are persecuted for their faith, particularly over this Easter season. And we pray for their protection, for their courage and bold witness to Christ, and that you would sovereignly move upon their persecutors to turn them to Jesus, to confuse their attempts to damage your people and rather to turn them to yourself. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Please join with me in the words Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Well, God bless you this Easter Sunday, this resurrection day of our Lord Jesus. And we look forward to catching up with each other over the phone and maybe some further comments uh, here now and uh, during the week, and uh, again next week, next Sunday. See you then. God bless.
our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Friends, please be seated. Let's begin with the prayer of preparation and say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Jesus said, this is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Friends of Shoin and the Kyrie, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. We share now for our hymn of praise the great 